Hi, I'm John Corcoran, Executive Director of the American Road Society. I'd like to welcome you to week one of the ARS Consulting Rosarian School, and we will be covering CR mission, CR mission and ethics, soil and water, and chemical safety. So glad you're a part of this today. I'd also like to bring to your attention, if you notice when you logged in, you saw a time for roses coming home to America's Rose Garden. We will have a national convention at America's Rose Garden in Shreveport, Louisiana, May 5th through the 7th. I hope you will join us for a whole bunch of fun and a lot of roses in Shreveport, Louisiana, May 5th through the 7th. To go over instructions today, I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Gary Chen. Uh, to tell you how today is going to go through as we go through our different speakers and how to ask questions. Gary? All right, welcome everybody. We've got several nice programs today. So when we do the, if you have questions and you're a consulting Rosarian candidate, please, before you ask your question, type in candidate and then ask your question. And uh, after each of the program speakers, we will do a 15 minute question and answer session and the rules will apply also. Now, if a couple of you are logged on, please note both your names so that we can give you guys credit for attending the uh, seminars. So I'll turn it back over to John. Thank you, Gary. And to cover the first uh, presentation today of CR Mission and Ethics, I'm so proud to be able to introduce our president, Ms. Diane Summers. She is the 57th president of the American Rose Society. She has been growing roses for over 40 years. Her new garden in Wisconsin has over 170 roses of all varieties. In addition to serving as ARS president, Diane has served as the ARS treasurer. NCD District Director, Region 5 Regional Director, in addition to chairing many ARS committees. Most recently, as Chair of the Strategic Planning Committee, Diane spearhead, spearheaded the implementation of technology solutions that societies and members increase the access and quality of programs and speakers for consulting Rosarians, local Rose Societies, and members. Diane is a past president of two local Rose Societies and has been awarded the ARS Silver Honor award and two bronze honor awards for her contributions to the north central district the milwaukee rose society and the wakasha rose society she has also been recognized with the outstanding consulting rosarian award and the outstanding judge award for service in her district diane is the ars master rosarian and an accredited horticulture and arrangement judge diane ah uh, thank you everyone can you hear me I think yes, that's a can. yes. <laughs> well, welcome everyone uh, to our uh, Consulting Rosarian series. We have uh, two, two weekends of this, two Saturdays, and I'm so pleased that you joined us today. When you saw that original slide that talked about the upcoming convention, I want to make sure that we call your attention to our silver sponsors who are so generous in supporting our convention. We had Heirloom Roses, um, as well as Jackson and Perkins Roses. So make sure that you go to their websites and purchase roses from those two very special sponsors. Jackson and Perkins happens to also be a member benefit partner. And with that, um, members receive 20% off when you purchase roses from Jackson and Perkins. We also have Bonide, who's been a, just a tremendous partner to the American Rose Society as well. And then we also have uh, individual type sponsors, uh, including Joe Bergs, the San Diego Rose Society, and the Gulf District of the American Rose Society. So these are our silver sponsors that are, again, are contributing to the success and funding for that uh, absolute wonderful event that we have scheduled for May. And I sure hope I see you there. So we're gonna get started today by talking about uh, the commitment of consulting Rosarians. You know, on this call, we actually have, we have candidates who want to become a consulting Rosarian. We have consulting Rosarians who are here to, um, to get credits and make sure that they're, you know, enhancing their education on roses. And then of course, we have many, many others, 
members and non-members of the American Rose Society who are here to learn more about roses. So this is a great opportunity for all of us. So uh, I will apologize as we get through some of the details just overall of our Consulting Rosarian program, but it is important for all Consulting Rosarians, you know, set the, the reminder, if you will, it's the beginning of the year on what a Consulting Rosarian is all about. And if you're not a Consulting Rosarian today, perhaps this is something you would like to consider for the future. Um, and if you're a member of a local Rose Society, of course, this is an opportunity to think about all those opportunities where the consulting Rosarians in your local Rose Society can be helping you and supporting your Rose Society. So we start with our commitment for our consulting Rosarians. We're very fortunate to have, I think it's over 800 consulting Rosarians at this time, who are really the ambassadors for the American Rose Society. This is what makes our education mission possible for the American Rose Society are these experts who are willing to share their time and their knowledge with others throughout the country. And so we're asking our consulting Rosarians to truly um, consider that commitment seriously to support uh, local Rose Societies as well as um, the, the American Rose Society. We'll talk a little bit about the consulting Rosarian role within a local Rose Society. Our consulting Rosarians participate in every aspect of a local Rose Society. Uh, all our local Rose Societies are focused on Rose education. So of course, it's those consulting Rosarians that have that expertise, if you will, in, in growing uh, roses um, that support the activities of the Rose Societies. It's important that we share knowledge with individuals within the Rose Society uh, and that we're proactive in doing that. We're proactive in suggesting programs. We understand, you know, what are the needs of the general rose growing public and, and provide ideas on how to support them with that. Um, and to be available, not only to our Rose Society members, but our friends, our neighbors, and the general public, wherever we happen to be. And of course, volunteering to help. And volunteering is much more than just the opportunity to put on a program for your local Rose Society. It may also include holding an office in your local Rose Society or district, heading up a, a committee, uh, performing other tasks that are needed from the local, by the local Rose Society. And of course, we wanna make sure that we can help all gardeners, especially those new Rose gardeners, by keeping it simple. There's a wide variety of roses in the market today. Uh, we can easily become successful at having beautiful roses in our gardens, and we need to share those simple steps with all rose gardeners. Now, in the consulting Rosarian garden, we want to make sure that we're growing a wide variety of roses and that we continue to expand our own experiences and our knowledge base. Uh, many of us have been consulting Rosarians for quite some time, but the world of roses continues to change. And so we need to stay on top of those changes. And of course, attending lectures such as this series um, help us to do that. We want to be knowledgeable about the use of chemicals or other options in our rose gardens to keep our roses healthy. And we always want to be welcoming our visitors um, to the garden because that of course is where you start to, to um, gain that interest and uh, the desire for other people to be growing roses and more roses in your garden. This happens to be a picture of my rose garden uh, last summer. The requirements to remain an active CR, I know many people are on this call for just that purpose. You need to be, of course, an active member in the ARS as well as in your local rose society. You need to demonstrate that interest and willingness to share knowledge, to volunteer. Um, you you want to make sure that you are staying current on current rose gardening um, techniques and what's happening. And so because for that, we ask that you have continuing education credit. Throughout uh, today and next Saturday, you will gain the four um, 
credits that you require for uh, continuing as a CR, one of which, of course, includes the use of chemicals in the garden. We want to make sure that uh, we're, we're available. So you have to be willing to share your name, your email address, so that people can reach you, of course. And um, if it's required in your district, you'll want to share or complete a CR report. Also, we ask that you uh, participate in the Roses and Review program. Um, it's not required, but of course, it is another opportunity for our consulting Rosarians to be sharing their insight and information on growing roses. Now, as a consulting Rosarian, you really should not be charging any kind of fee for your services. However, I know I've been in situations where an organization may like to provide an honorarium. And if that is the case, I would recommend that you actually ask them to send that either to your local Rose Society or district to support ongoing um, Rose education opportunities, or perhaps uh, send it to the American Rose Society. That's what I generally do uh, for our annual fund so we can continue to develop programs such as this, or to the Education Endowment Trust of the American Rose Society. Now, the consulting Rosarian role within the American Rose Society is very similar to that within the local Rose Society. It is to assist our members and our non-members with any questions that they might have about roses and rose care. It is to assist us in obtaining new members for the American Rose Society. And we all have a great opportunity to do that um, when we are doing programs um, on rose care. If you think about it, most of the information that you may know about roses probably came from your local Rose Society, probably came from um, another consulting Rosarian. So that's how we all grow and learn more about roses. And it's important to share um, that knowledge and to support the American Rose Society so we can continue to grow and continue that support for Rosarians. You should encourage your, rose, uh, your societies to, um, to have a rose show every year. The rose shows we know are just great opportunities to share with the public what kind of roses are growing in our area. And of course, not only should you um, support you know, having a rose show, you should be there, you should be active with the rose show, and you should be there to answer questions from the public on all the beautiful roses that they're going to see. Perhaps your district has CR meetings, you of course want to attend those. Um, and you want to have a willingness, again, to share knowledge um, about growing roses across uh, your district and about the consulting Rosarian, um, about consulting Rosarian programs. The American Rose Society is developing more and more programs that can be used for local Rose Societies on grow, growing roses. And we need our consulting Rosarians to support those efforts and to provide those types of programs that can be shown either um, on site or could be shown virtually by local Rose Societies. In addition to the, the consulting Rosarians having a role for the American Rose, in the American Rose Society, our American Rose Society really has um, a commitment to our consulting Rosarians. Part of that is to really provide an infrastructure that supports, oops, that supports um, ROSE education and programs. And we do that by having our national CR chairs, our district consulting Rosarian chairs, and to be sharing best practice by having a local ROSE Society chair. We also at the American ROSE Society provide education content, information, and programs to help our consulting Rosarians grow and become uh, more familiar with what's happening within the rose industry. And this year, we're gonna actually be doing more of that through video. And I encourage all of our consulting Rosarians to help support um, those videos and participate, uh, perhaps when you're asked to do so. Just a quick slide on the consulting Rosarian team. 
which includes our National Consulting Rosarian Chairs. Thank you, Mike and Anita Eckley, who are taking on just a huge role here in rose education for the American Rose Society, as well as all of our district CR chairs who provide that um, role within your districts. And finally, I do wanna make sure that you're aware of future edu educational opportunities that have been planned or are in the planning process. And on February 23rd, there is going to be an ARS judging um, photography program put on by Pam Powers. Pam is our ARS national chair for photography. So we're very pleased to do this. I know for some of our, um, our, our judges who are not real familiar with how to judge photography, this will be just an absolutely great session. On April 22nd, we have Dr. Raymond Cloyd from Kansas State University, who will be speaking on rose insects and pests. And of course, on May 5th through the 7th, we have our national convention. And there is a great a group of speakers, very talented speakers on all types of um, programs on, on roses. So I would absolutely uh, highly recommend that you, uh, that you attend. Uh, of course, we'll have a lot of fun, but we'll also learn a lot more about roses. And we're going to be featuring uh, the, up, the upgraded gardens at the American Rose Center, and you will want to see that. We have other programs that are in process. We haven't determined all the dates for them yet, but we have Dr. David Slezak, who is going to be doing a program on genetic research and repeat bloom. We have Suzanne Horn will be doing a review of the 2023 Horizon Roses. Um, that'll be later in the fall. Uh, we have a virtual arrangement judging school plan. This will be the first one on the arrangement side that we're doing. And of course, it's a hybrid plan because there'll be part of it that'll be virtual. And then part of it, we have to plan for um, in person as we're um, judging ro uh, rose arrangements, right? It takes a little more planning to get that in place. But right now, it's, it, we're looking at July or August to put that on. Um, and then we're also in the process of building a rose breeder series that you'll want to, that you'll definitely want to attend. So I want to thank all of you for um, attending today. Again, this is just the start, right? And uh, there's much more to, to learn today, to learn next Saturday, and of course, throughout the year as uh, our gardens flourish and we attend uh, events either at the local level, the district level, and at the national level. So um, thank you so very much for your time today. Thank you, President Summer, for a very informative program about consulting Rosarians. And we'll begin our 15-minute Q&A session. Again, if you are a candidate, list candidate and then ask your question. I have a couple of questions now from Melissa Balder. She says uh, she thought Cindy Dale was the Deep South Chair. Uh, can you confirm who is the current chair? Um, I guess I, I wasn't aware there was a change in that uh, chair, so I guess I'll have to go back to the uh, to Cindy to confirm that. But All that right. might be uh, more more new information, if you will. She also asked Melissa Balder again, do you have any thoughts or on presenting any updates on rose rosette disease? Hoping they are making some progress on developing disease resistance. Yeah, thank you for that question on rose rosette disease. The American Rose Society is participating in uh, some some studies related to rose rosette disease and on the enhancements to control it um, throughout um, the country. We're doing that through our um, research endowment trust. We're funding some of that support uh, through um, a current grant that's been um, obtained. I think you've seen an article that was just in our Rose magazine about that. There'll be talks about that actually at the convention and we will be following up um, with additional information yet this year, either through another um, article at the end of the season or perhaps a webinar. So we absolutely have been very supportive in Rose Rosette 
research and we will continue to provide information to um, our members and of course our consulting Rosarians. All right, I've got a question from Nancy Chu. Can Canadians participate in the Consulting Rosarian program? Uh, yes, um, Canadians can participate in the CR program and um, there's no reason why they can't. So um, if there's a qu further question on that, I would ask that you reach out to Mike and Anita and we'll make sure that uh, we can address that for you. All right, uh, let's see. Malcolm Davis would like to ask, at those CR meetings held at district events, will there be credits provided for attending? Yes, there will be credits provided as long as you, uh, there, those credits are granted or approved prior to the program by your district CR chair. So you want to make sure at a local meeting, for example, that prior to your meeting, you are sending that information and getting approval from your district CR chair. Then it's important that at you take um, uh, a list of who attended it, right? And provide that back to your district CR chair who would then um, inform the American Rose Society so that we can make sure that we're tracking those credits. All right, Phyllis Godfredson would like to know, uh, can you say how the recent severe weather may have impacted the ARS Rose Gardens in Shreveport? Well, I, I, I guess I can give a little insight because I actually just spent a whole week down in Shreveport, came home yesterday. Um, you know, it's um, it's probably too early to tell. Uh, we were, we you know, I did walk the garden even though it would rain the whole time I was there. We certainly can see many of the roses, the canes are bright green. Many of the roses have growth starting um, and some of them are leafed out. So I think it's a little too soon for us to tell. We had a great discussion with Claude Graves and Pam Smith and our uh, Don Morgan, who's our garden director, on you know really keeping track of what's happening to the roses following that crazy deep freeze that they experienced at the end of December. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to watch, and I asked Claude and Pam the question on with, with um, global warming and changes in climates, do we even need to consider how perhaps we start to um, plant and treat our roses differently? Is there a climate change going on, right? Now, I happen to live in zone five, so, you know, a quick... Um, winter freeze in December or January isn't like a real concern to me because I expect it, right? And so do my plants. Um, but of course, it's different in different parts of the country. So more to come on that. We're hoping that, um, you know, we know we're going to probably lose a few plants because of that. I think it dropped like from the 70s to the teens in the matter of hours in at the end of December. But um, we're hoping that most roses do come through. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, Alita Gonzalez would like to know where can one view the education program for photography? Uh, the program that was, if you're referring to the program that was done in January, that is out on the American Rose Society website. Um, and I know John and Kim are on. I, I don't know how to give them guidance as to exactly where it is. I haven't looked. Um, in the last few weeks, but it is out on the website. Yes, if they go to uh, resources, then videos, it should be there. It's also on our American Rose Society YouTube channel. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. All right, Brian Townsend would like to ask, there is a Facebook group combating Rose Rosette, and he's just posted the link to it. Thank you. Was there a question with that, Gary, or just a, a comment? It was just this comment. I thought I'd mention okay. it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'm looking, it doesn't appear to be. I wanna thank you all. Those are great questions. Um, if you have more, you know, you can please reach out to me or to the American Rose Society and we'll make sure that we, we get those answered for you. 
I think we can go ahead and go to the next presenter. And I'll turn it over to Mike Eckley. Uh, I'm so pleased to uh, introduce Dave Ingram. He lives and gardens in Denver, Colorado. When he first bought his home, he inherited a scraggly, neglected Mr. Lincoln hybrid tea, which won his heart with his resilience and fragrance. He now has over 100 roses in his yard, tends another 100 at his partner Susie's house, and volunteers to tend hundreds more at the Hudson Garden Public Rose Garden. As an endless student of all things roses, he is well aware of the challenges that both soil and water pose to gardeners of all skill levels. He is currently president of the Des Denver Rose Society, a master rosarian and a bronze medal winner. He writes articles on all aspects of rose care and teaches rose classes too. To well, anybody who would listen. Uh, it, he is really a wonderful presenter. Any place he ever goes, he seems to bring back members. Uh, I'm so happy to introduce Dave. Thank you. Dave, we can't hear you. Okay, hey, what do I need? What do I need to do here? Okay, <clears throat> on my you are. Was... Okay. You are. <clears throat> it's not working. Yes, we can hear you now. We see your presentation. Okay, I guess I had to click something there. My fault. Well, hello everybody and welcome to our presentation on soil and water. I've included air to that because air in the presence of air within soil is so important. I was kind of thinking about calling this presentation soil and water and air, oh my which is kind of a line from the old movie, The Wizard of Oz. And I guess that can kind of work because soil in many cases to a lot of us is kind of unknown and mysterious. So maybe we'll see if we can pull back the curtain a little bit on some of the mysteries of soil. And perhaps all of us can start on the way down the yellow brick road to becoming soil wizards. Because the better you grow your soil, the better your roses will perform. So this presentation has been adapted from the work of others to kind of complement the current consulting Rosarian manual. Any mistakes in here are mine, and I accept that. I've added some rose photos that my partner Susan and I have taken over the last year, just snapshots. They're kind of a reminder of why we work with the soil to try and produce the flowers that have so won our hearts. And for all the CR candidates watching today, keep an eye out for red highlighted text. I may not give you the answers, but I'll try and explain the whys so that you can understand how to answer your, these questions better. What I've learned over the years is that roses have stories. They're at the heart of so many family stories. If I visit a garden, people may point to their trees or their shrubs, but they'll tell me stories about their roses. And so in that spirit, I'd like to try and take us on a journey to examine the story of soil. Now, soil can be something of a mystery to us, so perhaps this is a mystery story. And in that vein, I hereby appoint every single one of you watching today as official soil detectives as we examine 
and this thing that we can't see within and try and learn how to manage it to give better results. And the first clue I have for you here is that there's something like 70,000 different soil types in the United States. And so while I'm gonna to present to you today kind of an overview of all the accepted, uh, you know, the framework of how to have good soil, ultimately the best results are gonna be local in your yard and in your area. And so how do we as soil detectives learn to examine and get the best answers in our area of the country? Local row societies are a great resource for information about soil conditions. The members are all battling uh, the conditions. And if you're not a member of a row society, you can definitely reach out and learn a great deal from them. The American Row Society has a lot of information on their website, and they have great links to help find local row societies near you. State extension services often have excellent science-based information, and the army of master gardeners out there are, have been trained to be detectives in all areas of local gardening conditions. There's also various government agricultural resources, which also will have good science-based information. Because while I can give you the the basic information about what constitutes a good soil, the conditions in your local area are going to determine what the best practices are and how you proceed from there. So, okay, all you detectives, let's have a look at how we approach and grow our soil. Basically, soil consists of, soil consists of several ingredients one of the most important ones is just a lot of empty pore space. The various proportions of all of this determines what we call soil structure. That's something that's important for us to know. Here's some of the purposes of soil. That the better our soil works for us in our yards, the better all our plants will perform. Part of the ideal garden soil, I don't know if any of us exactly have this uh, conditions, I wish I did, but basically the mineral content, the various particles of the soil take up about 45%. Organic matter is only around 5%. It's interesting, you don't really need more than that to make your garden function well. Imagine kind of a, a, a great big bell curve that goes from zero to above 5%. 5% is the best. The less organic matter you have, the less performance you'll get out of your uh, plants. And if you go over 5%, the performance will begin to decline and it can cause other problems with root rots and things like that. But on the, in an ideal soil, basically half of your soil under your feet is composed of pore space, empty space that can, contains both air, which is very important, as well as water. And these percentages can vary slightly depending on whether you've just watered or you're about to water. But just keep in mind it's important that your plants access oxygen as well as H2O. And so in many soil conditions around the country, it's important that we stay out of our gardens because we want to avoid soil compaction. I know here in Colorado with our heavy clay soil, the number one issue that we get into uh, is soil compaction that causes problems in our gardens. A single step in fresh garden soil can compact your soil 80%, just like that. You can destroy your pore space very quickly and it can take a long time to grow back. So one of the things that we should do as soil detectives is puzzle out ways for us to preserve our soil and the pore space within it. And it's best that we not walk excessively in our soils. The various <clears throat> the 
uh, mineral particles that compose a soil. There's several of them. Sand is the one we can see, the biggest ones with a lot of empty space between them. This can be a problem because uh, the, all that empty space, water can run through too quickly. Clay, I kind of took the diagram and elongated it because clay really is kind of a, you know, a, a flat, elongated uh, structure that can pack together really densely. Look at that. You can get 12,000 uh, clay particles to an inch, and this makes it really difficult for either air or water to penetrate this. They can pack together like dinner plates, and so that can be a real challenge for us to work with as gardeners. If one of the particles dominates in your yard, you can actually feel that it is dominant. And here's some of the issues that, that this can cause if uh, anything in your garden, including organic material, is, uh, has too much presence. <clears throat> but generally, we need to know more than just this to determine what our soil structure is. The texture of your soil matters for these reasons. All of them are important. Both the ability of your garden to hold water as well as to allow excess water to drain away. You also, as I've mentioned, need to allow air to penetrate into the soil, to provide oxygen to the soil life and the roots. All three are important. Here's a little test that can help determine your soil structure. You just put some soil in a, a jar with a bit of detergent and shake it up, set it down. And, you know, after a minute or so, the sand will settle to the bottom. Maybe it'll take an hour or so for the silt to come down. The clay, however, can take hours and maybe over a day before it finally settles out. So it could take a while. And then you measure the each layer and figure out what the percentages are. Once you've done that, you can go to the soil triangle and this will give you some indication of kind of the composition of how your soil stacks up. In the example that we just saw, it's roughly 60% sand. You see it along the bottom there. On the right is the percentage of silt, and on the left is percentage of clay. So what we've got here is about you know, roughly a 60 by 20 by 20 composition, which puts the soil sample that we just saw into the sandy loam category. And guess what? It just so happens that sandy loam is the ideal soil for roses. See all that red up there? <coughs> See our candidates? But let's go back and ask the question as detectives, why is sandy loam the best? <clears throat> the extra presence of sand allows for good drainage. The loam and maybe a little extra clay there right next to it, along with the presence of organic matter, allows this soil to hold on to adequate water for plant roots. So this is why we consider this to be the best for our gardens. Okay. I can imagine that everybody listening today is sitting there going, okay, Dave, I don't think my soil is quite like that. So how do I add or subtract to my soil to turn it into sandy loam? Well, the, the problem and the truth there is that it's not really that easy. It can be very difficult to change the, uh, the structure, the proportions in your soil. You can cause more harm than you achieve good by trying to do it. So what most of us do as gardeners is we work with what we have. And I think that you will find uh, with our new CRs, as you go out and visit other people's gardens, you're gonna find that pretty much all gardeners are working with their existing soil and trying to do the best they can with what they have. So with someone building a new garden, Probably the best advice is to go out and get a professional soil test so you really understand exactly where you're starting. And we'll look at that later in the program, soil test. <clears throat> and then following recommendations, you go in and amend the entire garden area as consistently as possible. And your goal is to improve the drainage as well as the water holding ability of the soil. If you're digging a planting hole outside of the garden just by itself, 
you want to dig a, a wide and deep hole because you want to avoid issues with what's called soil interface problems. That if you have two radically different kinds of soil, you know, the soil that you've just amended along with the native soil, which out here in Colorado is apt to be horrifying clay, you can have issues because the, the plant roots can't go from one type of soil to another easily, and neither can air and water. You can easily, be it in a garden or in a planting hole, <laughs> create kind of a swimming pool effect where <clears throat> water gathers and drowns your plant from below. And you're sitting there going, ah, oh, what just happened? So drainage in a new garden and, and how it works can be very important. <laughs> Basically, <clears throat> you know, subject to the local varieties in your local area, the, the single idea to improve the native soil in your areas has to do with the addition of organic material. And these are three of the ones that we tend to use a lot to add to our gardens. And, and all of them have great benefits for gardens, but all of them also have questions and issues. For instance, peat is no longer really a sustainable product, so I've moved away from using it. Manure has to be aged before you put it in your garden, and it's also good to know where this manure came from so you can be sure that you're not adding extra salts to your garden, which is not a good thing. Salt can pull water and nutrients away from the roots and cause a lot of damage within your soil. So a lot of us these days are using compost. And compost is, can be great. It's a wonderful product. It's old, decayed, living material. But there also can be problems with compost. Here in Colorado, they did some research on bagged compost that you buy in stores. And they found that pretty much all of them were really high in salt content. Partially, this is, um, I believe, because a lot of bag composts will use um, manures that come from feedlots and such. But again, what goes into your compost determines how well your soil performs. And so it's useful to become soil detectives here as you go out to shop for a product to put in your garden. To, you need to look for a plant-based low salt product. And there's no real national standards that I'm aware of that control this. And so with bag compost, you, you need to ask questions at the nursery. And if you go to a um, landscape company for uh, compost, you need to ask them what's in it and what the soil, salt content is like. The very best companies are happy to provide those answers. So don't be afraid to ask. Organic matter can provide many benefits in your garden. These are just three of them. And you know, if you're taking a test to become a CR, you, you know, you just might encounter a question where they ask you, what doesn't fit? And so if you see a question like this on the benefits of organic matter, these are, are benefits that, that, that act, are actual benefits. And maybe take notes on what works in your garden and what doesn't so that you can tell the difference. Organic matter contains both living and dead organisms. The dead, uh, the compost that we add to our gardens will decompose into humus, which does a lot. Humus, as it becomes uh, older and older, humus can last for a long time in our gardens and is very valuable in creating soil structure that helps our soils work better. It also produce humic acid, which is a key to um, producing your soil structure. That It's like a glue that will help bring particles together to form soil aggregates. And these aggregates come together to form what's called soil pads. And this is what gets uh, built up into your garden and helps to form the pore space and, and just along with the uh, living organisms in your yard will help improve your soil enormously over time. Here's the, the idea. You're mixing ingredients with a shovel 
but over time, your soil will create itself by using all these living organisms that are inside of your, your soil. And I mean, there's so many of them. The ones on the left, a single teaspoon of good garden soil can have hundreds of millions of these things in there. Almost every one of them is beneficial in doing a job to breaking down your organic material. The fungi, even if they're not high in numbers, will send out yards and yards of hyphae to help break down your organic material and provide nutrients to your plants, help build soil structure. And the, the organisms on the right will help move the soil around. Many of us, I hope most of you, know the benefits of earthworms and how their castings can help create better soil and provide more nutrients to your plants. I'm starting to think of my garden, <clears throat> if you'll pardon me for this, as some sort of enormous hotel that's full of living organisms where I, it's up to me to try and learn how to keep all of the windows as wide open as I can so that air can come in and water and can interact with all of these living organisms to build and provide a better soil and better conditions for the plants we put in them. And of course, for us, that means roses. Here's three different kinds of benefits of living organisms. All of them are important. They help pro uh, produce the glue that builds your soil structure. All the work they do is very important. And like I said, almost all of them are beneficial and needed in your garden. But here's a particularly good guy in there that will form a symbiotic relationship with the roots of your plants and it will send out hyphae far out into the soil past where your rose roots can go. And it's so interesting, the rose roots will actually exude out sugars and carbohydrates that the mycorrhiza need. And the mycorrhiza will bring in water and certain nutrients to the plant roots that it's hard for them to get on their own. And so a good network of mycorrhiza and rose roots can increase your plant's ability to reach in the surrounding soil by you know, over a hundred times in some cases. Mycorrhiza occurs naturally in all healthy soil. So it's not always necessary to add it. If you grow your soil well, they will be there when you plant a new rose and help it to thrive. There are some bad guys out there. And this is kind of the one that we tend to overlook sometimes. We're kind of used to it not mattering, but actually it exists in all soil everywhere. It's in your yard, this bacterium, the spores of it blow around. There's probably some right there in the room with you in the dust in different corners. What's important to know is that whereas a hundred years or so ago, it, it injured and killed a lot of people, by having your um, immunization shot a minimum of every 10 years, it will keep you safe. It's one of the best uh, immunization shots we have out there. For some older gardeners and gardeners in general, there's advice that maybe you'll want to have um, a tetanus shot more often than 10 years. And that is a discussion to have with your doctor to see what they think. As I said, it's very important for air to be able to get into the soil. I'm not going to try and tell you that there's like a breeze going through there or anything, but air can work its way into the, the uh, pore space and help move out the CO2 that builds up underground and provide new fresh oxygen, which the roots must have. <laughs> Also, the soil organisms that live underground need oxygen. So by having pore space that is accessible to air as well as water, that is one of the keys to having healthy, successful plants. So the role of water, of course, is, is crucial. And then with this slide, and for my candidates here, I'm focusing on the, the role of water within the rose plant, okay? There, uh, the, the, these are things that the 
are essential that work within the plant that don't really have to do with its role in the soil. So I'm going to take notes on this in case you're asked to pick out something that doesn't work in the rose plant. Water in the soil has many uses. It's, uh, it's a, it, you know, of course, it's as equally as important as air is under there. Here's a couple of them. There we go. Soil structure and water capacity are linked together that if your pore space is too big, such as in a sandy soil, the water can move away too quickly. and It's not available for roots. And if it's packed in too tight, the pore space, it's very hard for both water and air to get in there. Soil particles can actually, by process called adhesion, hold water against themselves. And this water is not available to plant roots. And so when all you have left in your soil is this water that's stuck to the particles, you've reached the wilting point of your plant. So that's one end of the spectrum. But water that drains away and is no longer around also tells you when, the, your, uh, when it's time to water. And so <clears throat> these are the areas the plants can't use water. So you, it's kind of like Goldilocks. You, can't, you don't want to have too much and you don't want to have too little. I'm trying to use my mouse here. So we need to know how your garden holds water as well as how your garden drains. Here's a pretty simple test for water retention where basically we're pouring a quart of water into a gallon of your soil. And if your soil can hold about 50% of the water after an hour, that's good retention that makes it available to your plant roots. In terms of drainage, uh, if you fill up a can, as you're seeing here, and test how it drains, if it drains too quickly, uh, you may need a soil test that will determine that you have a sandy soil structure, and you may uh, have to add organic materials or of some sort in there to help retard the drainage. And if it drains too slowly, which is often the case with clay soils, there's various things that you can tr try to do to help improve your drainage. And here I want to empower all my soil detectives. Wherever you live, what is the best advice in your area to improve the drainage in the types of soils that you have there? There's all kinds of options. <clears throat> And a little detective work can maybe help you and your garden do better. With watering, you know, we all have different ways of doing it. My best advice is to just water slowly and deeply. We don't want to move, we don't want to flood the garden and move out all the air supply. But if we water slowly and the, the uh, water's allowed to penetrate deeply and widely, this will encourage root growth in the plant and give you a healthier plant that's better able to withstand the kind of changing and various uh, weather conditions that we keep running across. I think it's important to water at the base of the plant, particularly if you do it by hand like I do and avoid leaf wetness leaves that get wet for several hours or are able to build up humidity within the canopy of the plant are subject to fungal diseases and things like that. I mean, there isn't anything we can do about old mother nature and her evening rain showers, but we can minimize the problems and not make it worse ourselves by watering early in the morning. So if the leaves do get wet, they can quickly dry in the morning sun, keep our plants healthy. <clears throat> soil pH is something that can be confusing to a lot of people, so I think we'll just take a look at basically how it measures out and how it works for you, that there's a scale of pH that goes from 0 to 14, and both of those extreme numbers are in terms of plant growth and gardening. They're they're really bad, okay? They're not good. You draw, draw an X through those. 
that in the middle of the scale, the number seven demonstrates balance, a balance between acidic and alkaline conditions. And that's what the scale measures, is the acidity or the alkalinity of your soil. And the further away you get from a place of balance, the more trouble your plants have and, your, and the more you'll need to correct things. Roses do best in a slightly acidic soil between six and six and a half. And I'll show you why in just a second here. But what's interesting about this scale is that each number as it moves away from seven represents a tenfold increase of the number before. In other words, if seven is neutral, six is going to be 10 times as acidic as seven, five will be 100 times, and four will be a thousand times. And when you get off into these extremes, you're getting into all kinds of trouble. <clears throat> the reason is that as pH changes toward the ends of the scales, it can interfere with nutrients being available in the soil. It become chemically locked up and your rose roots can't access them and soil life can't help you. And so it's important to know where your pH is and also be know how to go about correcting it. The best way to determine exactly what your pH is is to have a professional soil test done. They have the instruments to really give you a precise number. I also find that some of the soil meters that you can get can give you a, a decent approximation. They may not be as precise as the soil test, but they can be useful. And I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of the, the little inexpensive test kits that you get finding or you find hanging near registers and nurseries. But here's a question for all of you soil detectives is what is the best way to, to accurately test pH in your area? You can test, you can check with a lot of local sources and get their advice on how to be aware of where your pH is. If you find that there's problems, you can take actions to try and correct it. Those with low pH generally add lime in the form of limestone to try and slowly remember that pH takes a little, it takes time to drift away from where you want it, but it also takes time to correct it. There's no fast fixes here. And so there's different kinds of limestone to use for different conditions. And so our candidates need to be aware of that. And if you live, let's say, particularly in areas to the east, where we have a lot of uh, acidic soils, you need to be aware of the, different, the difference between the limestones and when to use them. If your soil is on the alkaline side with a higher number, there's actually two answers that work. Both are useful. You can add sulfur to, uh, it says a quicker lowering, but really even so, it still will take time. But you can also add organic material which will help lower the pH and also buffer the effects of alkaline conditions. The main point here is that if, you, if your soil gets into the extremes of measurements, it's going to result in poor plant growth because you can't get the nutrients you need out of your soil. So this is an important thing to know about and to know how to correct if necessary. This is a paragraph from the current Consoling Rosarian Manual, which talks about soil testing. And soil chemistry is really complex, and it's it's really hard to just you know look or or touch or feel your soil and be sure of what's going on. And so the the very best way and the proper way, if you think you have a problem is to get a, a professional soil test done that will give you the exact answers you need to begin to resolve whatever problem there is. Many states will offer a, a, a soil testing uh, ability through your, the state extension service. This will be available to gardeners as well as uh, 
um, agriculture. There's also a lot of private labs available who will do this. I'd recommend selecting a lab that's close to you, your, your local state extension or a local lab who's more apt to be familiar with your area of soil conditions and can give you the best advice on what to do about what they find. Most soil tests will give you um, precise measurements on the texture of your soil that the fits into that tri soil triangle I showed you, a very accurate pH reading that you can compare to whatever other um, system you may be using to see how accurate that is, percentage of organic matter and whether how close or far away it is from 5%. And you can also get tests that will uh, tell you what the levels of all of the nutrients that your plants need to have. Many of the best rosarians that we have in the ARS are doing regular soil tests, often more than one a year, to make sure that their gardens are performing exactly the way they want them to and that the nutrients that they're trying to provide their plants are there in the proper quantities. So soil testing is very useful and very much worth looking into and doing at least on an on a occasional basis, if not a regular basis. The whole point of all this is to try and build something called good soil tilth in your garden, which is a combination of all of the stuff that I've been talking about, guided by your local best practices. That if you can create a, a, a really good porous soil that's adequately properly rich in organic matter and soil life. This is the key to having a great performing garden. And so my version of having a review of what I just said is that I think that if you, if you want to be a soil wizard, then it starts with becoming a good soil detective and learning what your soil, what's going on in your garden now, and learning the ways that you can help to improve that and make it better. Because in my estimation, let's see, come on here. If you learn to grow your soil well, your roses will thrive. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I'd like to take just a minute um, to talk to our honored guests today. I'm, I'm so delighted. We have over 500 people here at this presentation. And for many of you, yes, are Rose Society members and CRs, but there's a lot of you there that maybe are passionate about other areas of gardening and don't grow roses. And to all of you, I wanna say, welcome. And I'm thankful that you are here today. That whatever questions you, any questions you have about gardening, particularly roses, we are here to help you. The American Rose Society has so much information available and they can do so much to help connect you with local rose societies who are happy to help you with any of your questions and help any roses succeed. We don't ask for much, we hope to earn your membership. And even better than that, we hope to earn your connection and your participation. We can always use someone who's willing to get involved. So please consider us. And if you don't grow roses, I would like to invite all of you to plant a new rose bush this year. Go to a nursery and fall in love Roses can bring such color and fragrance to your and They can build and enhance your story, both within your family and with your friends. To me, roses are peaceful. Roses make me want to click my heels together three times and say, there's no place like home. And as we approach Valentine's Day, to me, roses are a symbol of the finest of all human emotions. 
to me, roses are love. And with that, I want to thank everybody and I'm ready to take some questions. Dave, thank you for making us all soil smart. Uh, <laughs> before, we, before we begin the uh, Q&A session, a reminder, these webinars are being recorded and they will eventually be on the ARS website for video. So if you have any uh, questions or you want to see some slides again or whatever, uh, wait, it will be on the ARS website. Uh, Susan, beginning our Q&A session, Susan Spare would like to know if your slides would be available. She'd like to get a copy. Um, I think I can make them available. I'm not sure if this uh, file will email well, but I can certainly make something like a, a PDF uh, copy of this and share. Uh, all I'll need is an email address. All right. Uh, John Riley asks, should humic acid be added to the garden? If so, how much and how often? Well, you know what my response is, is that, you know, based on um, the advice you get in your local area, generally, if you build your soil properly and have the right kind of, of good quality organic material, the humic acid will develop as a byproduct of the, the work of soil organisms. And so if a soil test indicates that you need something like that, okay. But I, my question back to you is, is that if you're doing it right, you, why do you need it? You, you probably shouldn't. It should uh, develop on its own. All right, and DeVries would like to add that they add 50 to 30 gallons barrels of crushed oak leaves to over 200 plus roses. Is this too much? Do a soil test. Um, I, you know, I, if, if you're adding it to, and I'm not, I guess I'm not clear, are you using it as mulch? Uh, which could be very beneficial since they're oak leaves, are you mixing it into the soil? You'll need a soil test to determine what your overall um, level of organic matter is within your soil. The higher it gets above 5%, this can cause problems. Uh, it can help retain too much water that can cause root rot. You'll find that in general, the plants won't grow as well with too much organic matter. That was a great lesson that I learned at being a, a master gardener here in Colorado through Jefferson County. So do a soil test to find out, uh, do a little detective work, and the answer will show up in the mail. All right. Well, Tammy Young states that biochar was advertised to provide spaces for the organisms to live in. Do you recommend amending soil with biochar? As much as I know about biochar, yes. Uh, you know, depending on the quality of the product and where you get it from, you know, again, the qualities can vary, but biochar can help create extra pore space. There are other products that you can put into certain soil conditions, particularly clay soils that can help in that way. That was kind of beyond the, the scope and time limit of a program like this. But yes, um, <clears throat> biochar can be beneficial. All right, Mike McDonald, how does one know what the salt content is in compost manure? Is it is certain types best to avoid? I think that's a great question. And it, <clears throat> you can have tests done on manures. I'm not actually aware today that there is, you know, I, I don't think you can put it in a jar and shake it, you know, to figure out if, if there's salt in it or not. But in general, if you're aware of the source 
the, this manure is coming from, you'll kind of know, you, you know, from the feed and the living conditions, uh, you know, often uh, manures that are coming from places like feedlots, where they're giving a lot of medication and, and specialty feeds, that's where a lot of salt can come from. And so in particular, if you've aged the manure, which can basically take a year and will take out a lot of the, the, uh, the excess salts and, and materials so that what you have is a good, basic, organic, healthy, organic material. All right, Sonia says that this fall, she found out the city of Syracuse, New York, municipal water pH is 8.3. That is the water that they used for watering 40 hours a week for the Mills Garden in Syracuse during the drought. pH of the beds is mostly 6.8 to 7.2. Thoughts on how to handle the impact of municipal alkaline water pH as they use for their roses. I think that's really an excellent question. <clears throat> and I think my answer is going to start with, <clears throat> if you're in Syracuse, I think you're close to the base of Cornell University, which has one of the best uh, extension outreaches of any university that I'm aware of. So my first question is, what do they think is going on? Um, if your basic soil conditions there are acidic, then this alkalinity, uh, whatever leaches out of the water, which may not be that much depending on other things they put into the water, it may actually help balance your gardens out. Uh, <clears throat> the water here in Denver is also uh, highly alkaline and we're alkaline to start with. So because of that, I'm testing my soil a lot to make sure that the pH stays where I want it to be. So look locally for um, answers, both through the Master Gardener Network and through Cornell, because they are probably actually out there digging in your type of soil and taking measurements about what this uh, water content is doing. All right, Alan Davies, would like a recommendation to improve air space in soil. Well, if you have an old garden, particularly one that nobody's done anything for a while, one of the best things you can do to start with, besides doing a soil test to find, you know, your, your basic where you're at, uh, with structure and organic material. But generally, if you add organic material to the top of the soil, maybe pull back your mulch, lay down a quarter, half an inch of a good compost, the uh, soil organisms will pop to life. They'll begin breaking it down and the organisms and earthworms will start moving it down. And it can be a slow process, but that's one of the uh, ways that you can improve soil that exists over time. A lot of the other methods have to do with basically, you know, redoing your whole garden if you have a, a really severe problem. But in general, the slow approach over time for an older garden can yield big results. All right, uh, candidate Alita Gonzalez, when you have different areas in your yard that has roses, should you test each soil separately or can you add them all together and send to test? I think that's a wonderful question. Thank you, Anita. You know, many of us live in houses um, that, you know, were built, say, in the last 50 to 70 years where they stripped off all the topsoil and they drove bulldozers on there to dig around and they compacted everything underneath. And then they dumped a bunch of topsoil, maybe from different sources into your yard. And so this, um, this can create different conditions. You know, soil tests anymore can be kind of expensive. And so what I'm doing in my yard is that I will do a test 
in uh, one certain garden by taking um, examples from different areas in that one garden and mixing them together and sending it in to be tested. So yeah, I'm testing my different gardens separately. And in so doing, I found that one in the backyard, I live in an area with really heavy clay where just sometimes less than a foot underground, you're running into something that uh, you could drive race cars on. I mean, it's so dense. And then I found an area in the front yard that was really porous and actually came back with a, a, sand, a sandy loam designation, believe it or not, yippee. What I found with that is I have to kind of water it more often than some of the other gardens. So yes, unless you are certain that the soil conditions in each of your gardens is the same, then over time, I would test each to find out how they are different because that will determine the different approaches you might have to um, engage with in each of your gardens. All right, Melinda Borg, a candidate, would like to know of a specific book you can recommend to learn more about healthy soil. You know, I hope it's still in print. The one that I have is, uh, is called Improving Your Soil by a guy named Keith Reed. And I'm certainly open to, uh, to you know, to other suggestions of good soil books. There's probably a lot of them out there, but Improving Your Soil basically covers everything. It's, it's kind of more than you maybe want to know than, uh, about soil. And uh, also, it's good to have a, book, a generalized book about soil but in addition, what are the best, you know, updated um, resources in your area through your local extension? Here in Colorado, we have wonderful articles on soil, and they are looked at and updated every year or two for the latest science-based information. What does uh, local agricultural uh, government resources offer? Uh, because that's also equally valid to any book that's on a shelf. All right, uh, William Christian Williamson, the candidate, would like to know what is the ideal pH for well water for watering roses? Seven, neutral. I doubt anybody has well water exactly like that, but. Um, it's not so much the pH of your of your water or your well water, it's what effect uh, does it leach out into your garden soil? What effect does it have in your yard? Um, <clears throat> there's ways you can soften water. Uh, certainly if I had a well, I'd be having that uh, water tested uh, on a fairly regular basis to be aware of, you know, what is and isn't in there. But Unless there's something drastic going on, I, I wouldn't worry about it. But yeah, if you can, the closer you can get water to being neutral and balanced, the better it is for your yard. All right. Um, Malcolm Davis, a candidate, says, you mentioned wilting is caused by sitting water. Should you trim wilting leaves or leave them on for the sake of photosynthesis? Well, I guess what occurs to me is, is um, why is it wilting? Is the soil dry? Is it oversaturated so that there's too much water? Because the first thing you've got to do is figure out why the leaves and the plant is wilting. That's most important, and you have to correct that situation. That once something, a, a part of your plant has wilted, kind of loses the ability to do much good for your plant. And so uh, once you've got your basic conditions corrected, and particularly if you're seeing the plant start to respond, maybe put out new growth, um, I would cut away anything that um, is damaged or uh, it's just like any pruning or deadheading. I would take off anything that isn't doing its job. Once you've corrected, um, corrected the uh, causative factors. All right, Nancy Chu has this question about pet 
planted, potted, sorry, potted roses. Any use in testing the potted or bagged soil in a large rose container? Well, again, you know, um, <clears throat> a lot of potting soils are, are mostly kind of soilless combinations of uh, organic material. You can test it. I think I'd be inclined to test it only if I thought that something was wrong. But in general, I think it's the same thing as any organic material when it comes to potting soils. There's, um, in, in all honesty, there's some really bad stuff out there. Uh, stuff that, uh, you know, I bought some of it so I could save money. And what happened was my expensive rose bush up and died. And so um, I would say if you go out and buy the best quality potting soil you can and understand that the, it may have a lifespan of whatever it is, a couple, three years, um, I'm not sure that uh, testing potting soil is worth a is really worth the price unless you think something is wrong and you can identify imbalances through testing. All right, we've used up our 15 minutes for q and A. I'm gonna turn this back over to Mr. Corkin. John, you're up. All right, I'm so glad to uh, be introducing on our final part, which is on chemical safety, Mr. Craig Dorschel. Craig is from Worcester, Massachusetts, is the vice president of the American Rose Society. He is a retired chemist and has been a member of the American Rose Society for 25 years. He has served on the ARS Board of Directors as a regional director and district director. He is also a member of the New England, Connecticut, and Rhode Island Rose Societies. Awards received by Craig are the Bronze Honor Medal in 2008, the Silver Honor Medal in 2009, and the Outstanding Consulting Rosarian in 2011, and the Outstanding Horticulture Judge in 2019. He, he is a continuous patron level supporter of the ARS Annual Fund. Craig has written articles for local and district newsletters, as well as ones published in the American Rose Annual. He has given numerous lectures at local and district events and presented the most recent chemical safety webinar for the National Consulting Rosarian School in 2021 online. I'm so happy and proud to introduce Craig. Thank you, John. Greetings from Frigid, Massachusetts. Uh, what John didn't mention is that I'm actually a chemist by profession, so uh, that's the one occasion when I'll actually admit to being a PhD. Uh, I have with me also online my good friend Bruce Monroe, who is also a chemist and a lawyer. And in my talk today, most of the slides are mine, but I have a, a few photos that come from an older presentation by Steve Jones and Bruce kindly shared this material with me and I've incorporated some of that and I will give credit for that where credit is due. So for the Consulting Rosarian candidates, look for the hash mark in the talk and that will particularly highlight something that you need to know for your exam. I do commend the chapters in the Consulting Rosarian Manual to everyone. I think the, the relevant chapters on chemicals are are well written and up to date and apropos. But I like to go beyond the basics when I when I do this talk, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. So to start off, what's the chemical in the first place? And a chemical is everything and anything made of the chemical elements, or in other words, those things that you probably saw on, on the wall in a high school classroom once. It includes all animals, all vegetables, all minerals, all matter, and of course that includes us. But we're concerned with these things that we call pesticides. So what are pesticides? Well, the, the suffix side implies something that you use to kill something. So we talk about insecticides, chemicals that will kill insects, fungicides, chemicals that will kill or inhibit fungi, Miticides, chemicals that will kill mites, which are not insects, actually, they're related to spiders, or arachnids, or herbicides, which kill plants, rodenticides, which kill rodents, 
Velescicides, which kill mollusks, and what we would be concerned with are slugs on snails primarily. And we could include bactericides in this. Not that we use bactericides in the garden, but we, for instance, might sanitize the roots of a of a new bare root plant with some very dilute chlorine bleach. And in fact, if we come down with a say a strep throat infection, we swallow bactericides in the form of antibiotics to be able to, to uh, take care of the infection. And if we are unfortunate enough to have head lice, we would use an insecticide on ourselves. And probably everyone at one point or another has had athlete's foot or some superficial fun fungus infection, and then we apply fungicides to our cells. So yes, there's, there's a broader definition of pesticides than, than just things we use on plants, I suppose. Now these are all toxic to their targets, but they may very well be toxic to us too. So we're gonna talk about toxicity. How do we understand it? How do we measure it? How do we find information about the toxicity of substances? First, I wanna talk about the metric system a little bit since I wanna be sure that everybody is on the same page with this. Here's a list of nations that do not officially use the metric system. Number one, Liberia. Number two, Myanmar or Burma. Number three, the United States of America. And number four, oops, there is no number four. Those are the only three. But even here in the US, uh, the metric system is universally used in science and medicine and other things, including the beverage industry, I think because they don't want to deal with two different sizes of bottles or bottling lines. So that, that fifth of liquor is now 750 milliliters, and that soft drink, you're probably buying it by the liter or two liter uh, container. So here are some equivalents between the, the systems. A gallon is approximately close enough for our use, 3.8 liters. A liter is divided into 1,000 milliliters. A tablespoon, a common measure for these garden chemicals, but a tablespoon is a roughly 15 milliliters. In mass and weight measurements, there are 1,000 grams to a kilogram, 1,000 milligrams to a gram and about 454 grams to a pound. So a milligram is one one thousandth of, of one 450th of a, of a, sorry. Uh, a milligram is not very much, let's leave it that way. It's, it's a thousandth of one 454th of a pound. Uh, a kilogram is equivalent to about 2.2 pounds. Okay, let's, Consider this chap and see why he's relevant. Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus from Hohenheim, who called himself Paracelsus and who lived and flourished in the first half of the 16th century. Well, who was Paracelsus? Well, he styled himself as an alchemist, a physician, and certainly a polemicist. In fact, there's some suggestion, although it may be fictitious, that because of his written outburst, the term bombastic was was uh, coined to describe writings of that sort or utterances of that sort. Maybe true, maybe not. But there's a famous quote attributed to him: "All things in gift, or nicht is only gift. Rein die Dosis macht es, dass ein Ding kein Gift ist." or in English, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes it so that a thing is not a poison. Interesting, we'll see the relevance of that. And these three slides essentially came from Bruce. When, when I, what's going on here? Why is this not advancing? Craig, if you'll go and there click go. on your, there you go. I, we got it. When I looked up the quote, it was in Latin. Sola dose spachi venenum, only the dose makes the poison, basically saying the same thing more succinctly. So that leads us into a concept of, of the relative toxicity of things. And usually there's a number describing that called an LD50. So what is an LD50? 
LD50 represents the lethal dose of something that would kill 50% of an infected test population. It's expressed as milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And the lower the number it is, the more toxic the substance is. And the test subjects, I'm sure to everyone's relief, are generally rats and mice. And typically, this is done by feeding the substance to the animal. So just to reiterate, you've determined the one single dose of something when given to a test population that will kill 50% of it with that one dose. Here are some numbers for insecticides. Craig, uh, this is Bruce. Uh, we've had a request. Someone says you're you're going too fast, and they can't get all the information before you change the screen. So they ask that you slow down. If if you really want to make sure you get the information, you can do a screenshot and uh, go back and get it later. But uh, th thanks, Craig. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Uh, or let me say you could also wait till we post this on um, on YouTube or on our um, website, and then you can look at the slides, you know, on your own. Right. Okay. Diazinon was a common insecticide. It's now off the market, but it comes in at 250 milligrams per kilogram. Okay. Asaphate, better known as orthene, 700 milligrams per kilogram, so it's less toxic than diazinon. Okay, we I think we knew that. Uh, Malathion, another another oldie, comes in somewhere in the neighborhood of one to 1.4 grams per kilogram, less toxic still. Now here's something called disulfatide. Uh, this was sold for a good while as part of a combination granule. I believe it was insecticide plus fertilizer. And you put it on the ground and it was supposed to penetrate to your plant and kill the, any insects feeding on the plant. Problem with this stuff is it's extremely toxic, 2.3 to 6.8 milligrams per kilogram. And there were reports that Pets digging around it were getting sick and dying and very nasty stuff. I don't think it's available anymore, and I would say that's a very good thing. Uh, Parathion probably was used on crops. I don't know that it was ever intended for use by amateurs, but another very toxic one, 3.6 to 13 milligrams per kilogram. Now, all of these so far, they're all classified as organophosphates. What they are is milder versions of nerve gas, actually. And just for the sake of comparison, here's a real nerve gas, sarin. And that comes in at 172 micrograms per kilogram. So yeah, so war gases are really nasty stuff and much, much worse than these insecticides. But uh, the use of uh, pretty much any of these insecticides these days is dis discouraged. Imidacloprid was the most commonly used one of the neonicotinoids, which are controversial because of possible damage to bee, bee colonies in sublethal amounts. Uh, that's It's more or less managed from the market along with its relatives. But the, uh, the LD50 on that was uh, 430 for a rat, 131 milligrams per kilogram for a mouse. Uh, it's generally considered safe around mammals only because you use so little of it compared to what you would use of the phosphates. So in a way, it's unfortunate that uh, the problems with it exist with the bee colonies. Cyphlutherin is a synthetic pyrethroid related to the natural product pyrethrin. That comes in at about 500 to 800 milligrams per kilogram. Neem oil, interesting case. Uh, neem oil comes from an Indian tree, Azadiracta indica. Azadiractin is the one ingredient there, there that inhibits insect feeding. So uh, 
in other words, if a caterpillar or some other grub starts munching on the on the leaves of the neem tree, it would inhibit their feeding and the little buggers would starve to death. Uh, interesting, if you are using neem oil though, but that a lot of the neem oil that's sold has the azadiractin removed from it. So it may not be quite as useful. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, the figure that's given is greater than uh, 35, 40 milligrams per kilogram. And I don't know whether that's with or without the azadiractin. But when you see the greater sign on one of these, I think that means where they stop testing, that you, you, you fed that much in a single dose to one of these animals and they lived through it. And they said, enough's enough and we quit. It's not very toxic. Oriania is another natural product, uh, about 1,200 milligrams per kilogram. And here's one, nicotine. Of course, it's a natural product, comes from tobacco leaves. You can consider it to be very organic, also very toxic. It's about the same level as parathion. And you know, anyone who has smoked a cigar for the first time knows that nicotine has <laughs> can, can make you feel pretty ill at a sublethal dose. So uh, just because something is natural and organic doesn't mean it's non-toxic. This is a great example of that. Uh, looking at some fungicides, tabuconazole was is in the uh, BioAdvance product. We'll discuss a little bit more. It's better than three grams per kilogram for acute toxicity. Uh, Mycobutanil, which is in immunox, better than two grams per kilogram. Manzate, Mancozeb, comes in at about 3.2 grams per kilogram. In other words, all these are pretty low in acute oral toxicity. Chlorothalonil, better known as Dacanil, is essentially non-toxic orally. It's more than 10 grams per kilogram, but there's an asterisk on that, which I will explain shortly. Uh, Triferine, the old Funyanex, similar situation. It's, tox it's uh, lethal dose would be in excess of 16 grams per kilogram. But again, there's uh, there's asterisks on it that for the same reason as chlorothalonil that we'll get to. Now, some things around the house you might have. Caffeine, 150 to 200 milligrams per kilogram. Interesting. There's no warning label on a, on a sack of coffee beans. Uh, ethanol, well, you can drink yourself to death if you, if you get too carried away. That's seven to 11 grams essentially per kilogram. Aspirin about 200 milligrams per kilogram. And I would say everything else in your medicine cabinet, all your prescription drugs and your non-prescription drugs, even maybe some of the supplements, all could be toxic at certain levels. And that gets back to what Paracelsus was saying. Enough of something can be helpful, too much of something can be poison. Sodium chloride, table salt, about three to three quarters grams per kilogram, so it could be a lethal dose. Glucose, a sugar, 30 grams per kilogram, but it has a measurable LD50. So the other aspect of what old Paracelsus was saying is that dilution has an effect. You can render something that's toxic less toxic by dil simply diluting it. And here's an example. Uh, if we take the bioadvanced disease control for roses and flowers, two years ago, people were still calling it bear. I hope people are getting used to the fact that bear sold the uh, garden chemical products lines off uh, some time ago now. But that product is 2.9% tebuconazole, and that works out. I won't take you through all the math at 29 milligrams per milliliters coming out of the bottle. The uh, dilution rate is a well, tablespoon and a half per gallon, so call that 22 milliliters in a gallon. Uh, if you multiply those two numbers together in, in dilute solution, you have 638 milligrams of tebuconazole per gallon. 
Now the LD50 we said was at least three 3,000 milligrams per kilogram in rats. Let's just assume that's the same for people. So if you have an 80 kilogram person, which is 176 pounds, which in my case would be in my wildest dreams, uh, you multiply 80 kilograms times 3,000 milligrams per kilogram, that an acute oral dose to kill you, you would have to swallow 240 grams of this stuff. And if the if that were in the form of diluted spray, do some more math, and that works out to 376 gallons and change. So by diluting this, you have something which, which in itself, this diluted spray is has a very very low toxicity in itself, in and of itself. So that's the effect of dilution. But there's always a but isn't there? LD50 is not the minimum toxic concentration. You can have things like rashes, breathing irritations, eye irritations, allergic reactions, all possible at lower concentrations. Certainly in the case of nicotine, you won't get a fatal dose from smoking a cigar, but the first time you do that, you'll find that the that there's toxicity below lethal lethality. Uh, the LD50 concept is for an acute dose, a single dose that doesn't consider effects of long-term exposure. So that would be things like uh, carcinogenicity, causing cancer or mutagenicity, uh, problems with pregnancies. And of course, any rational adult is not gonna be swallowing this stuff. So what we need to be concerned with are other routes of exposure, mainly contact with the skin or contact with the eyes or inhalation. Now, where do you find out specific information about the toxicity of a product you're gonna use in your garden? First of all, the label. You wanna read the label and you wanna act accordingly. You wanna read the front and the back. On the front label, you will find the trade name of the product. In most cases, you'll find a list of the usages of the product, what it's effective on. You'll find the name of the active ingredient as a generic name. We'll be showing you all this more specifically. And you'll see a signal word, which is mandated by the government, which indicates the general level of toxicity of the product. So here, thanks to Bruce, is what a, what a label looks like and what it would tell you. So brand name or trade name, bugs are gone. Where used and what for? It generically controls insects on, on home lawns, flowers, vegetables, trees, and shrubs. Specific pests, see, there's a whole list of uh, of critters there that, that would be uh, offed by this product. D, the active ingredient that's toxic to the pest, says here it's 2.5% per methrin, 97.5% something else. <laughs> uh, the name of the manufacturer, uh, the fictitious kill em all chemical company of Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, the signal word here is caution, which means it's mildly toxic. There are higher levels that will go through. There's also an EPA registration number, which nice to know in an emergency, tells you how much a pint or for everywhere else in the world, except Myanmar in Liberia, 473 milliliters. So what's in the name? Uh, the trade name is a product name, for example, Bannermax, one that we probably all know. The generic name, the name of the active ingredient, in the case of Bannermax, it's called propaconazole. Now, this has been around for a while, so you can buy the same material simply labeled propaconazole, but you can also find it labeled, say, Honor Guard and several others. So actually the most important name to recognize on the label is the active ingredient more so than the, than the trade or product name. 
Uh, sometimes you see the, the full chemical name, which I will not <laughs> utter for you, but that translates for those of us in the know into this chemical structure, which are, you know, you can have the chemical structure and go back and create the chemical name. Uh, just as an aside, where do these generic names come from? Well, in the chemical name, where is my mouse? I don't see my mouse. Anyway, you see the word propyl in there. So there comes propiconazole. You see triazole, and there's where the azole comes in. So they put that together. They come up with a shorter and easier to remember and pronounce name. And if the, if the pointer were working, I could point out on the structure, but that's not really necessary. So here's a couple of real labels, courtesy of Steve Jones, one, one for old Pine and and the, the other one is Immunox, although the, uh, the name is cut off at the top and, and you can just sort of barely make out on there that it's, that it's triperine, six and a half percent in one and Michael Butanil and the other, along with the inert ingredients. And the information, disease control, what it stops, black spot powdery mildew, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the signal words? Uh, the signal word, danger, poison, as a skull and crossbone, highly toxic. You won't see too many of those uh, sold for general use by uh, unregistered applicators. Uh, those are products with the LD50 is zero to 50 milligrams per kilogram. So yeah, nicotine would fall in there, disulfatine would fall in there, uh, parathion would fall in there. So that's that's the bad stuff, the stuff that you really don't want to be using. Danger highly hazardous C label. We'll talk about that. That has something to do other than with an LD50, some other additional hazards. Uh, warning, meaning moderately toxic or hazardous, that's an LD50 between 50 and 500 milligrams per kilogram. Caution, slightly toxic, an LD50 greater than five, 500 milligrams per kilogram, and there seems to be a second level of that greater than 5,000 milligrams per kilogram. And the signal words are based on the active ingredient in the formulation. Okay, so we had asterisks on triferine and chlorothalonil, daconil. Why is that there? And here's the fundinex label again. You look in the red box there and you see the word danger. And a very small print, it says see back book for additional precautionary statements. In the case of both of those things, they will cause severe eye irritation if they get in your eyes. In fact, it could even cause permanent damage to your to your eyes. So that's why they're labeled danger. So those using either those products or anything similarly labeled really calls out the need for some very good eye protection while you're using them. The back label. Again, that will list the plants for which the product may be used. It'll list targeted pets give you the mixing instructions, tell you how much to use, are there any incompatibilities. I can cite one for you. There's a, a product called Aliette that's used for downing mildew. That does not work and play well with other chemicals, so you have to use that by itself. And I'm, I'm sure that it's labeled as such that there are incompatibilities. It will have storage and disposal instructions how, when, and how often to use the product, information about first aid and other emergency information. And here's Bruce's fictitious but realistic back label. So A, there's your precautionary statements, potential hazards. Uh, B, first aid information for, for ingestion, skin contact, eye contact, inhalation, uh, environment, Environmental hazards, good to know. Uh, it says this toxic is highly toxic to fish. If you have a product like that, and there certainly are some, you know, if you're near a lake or something, you don't want to get the product in the lake. It's pretty simple as that. Uh, personal protective equipment, and we'll certainly be talking a good bit about that, what they recommend to use. Uh, 
how to mix and apply, and how to store and dispose of. And many of these materials actually have a booklet on the back of the container that you can peel off a sticky strip and, and uh, read further information in the booklet. Here's another back label, a real one for a compass. You'll see it has uh, similar information on it, the ingredient, caution, signal word, uh, prote protective equipment, use safety equipment, first aid, environmental hazards, directions for use, et cetera. So that's, that's typically what you're going to see on the back label. Now, if you want to dig deeper, there is something called a safety data sheet. It was at one time called a material safety data sheet. Uh, chemical manufacturers are required to provide one of these for all of their products. They can contain quite a bit of additional and detailed information beyond what's found on the label of a product. If you would like to find one for a product, uh, this one site, www.greenbook.net, uh, has a list of some of them, or you can simply Google the name of the product or the name of the active ingredient, or and maybe add SDS or MSDS to your search, and and it'll pop right up, and you can you can download it. They're all all available free. Uh, if you do want to look at one of these, there are some considerations. They may and mostly assume that you're handling large quantities of material, so something rather than a small amount of material. So for instance, you can find a safety data sheet for sodium chloride table salt, and we'll tell you if there's a spill that you need to wear, wear goggles, respirator, gloves, uh, a Tyvek suit, and so forth. Now, if you tip over a salt shaker on your table, are you gonna put all that stuff on? No, you'll just, sweep it up and, and, and move on. But if you had, if you if 100 pounds of industrial grade sodium chloride, they might have a lot of fine dust in it that you don't want in your eyes or your lungs or on your skin if you're perspiring. That's another story altogether. And you would want to, want to clothe up for, the, for cleaning up a mess like that. So uh, there is a certain amount of common sense involved in, in interpreting these. They do, tend to use technical language, which uh, we can help you out with if, if there's a question. And here is one, this is for this is for Bannermax fungicide. And wouldn't you know, when I got this, I realized this is a Canadian data sheet rather than a United States data sheet, but they're, they're very similar. There's a, a few different acronyms for government agencies, but otherwise the information would be the same. So you notice it goes for six pages, there's product identification, what's in it. It, it lists two chemicals actually, propoconazole, 14.3%, and it lists that whole long name. It also lists tetrahydrofurfural alcohol, which is something which is not the active ingredient, but it's, but it's a chemical of interest that's in the formulation. Uh, and then there's hazard identifications, like you see at the top of this page, unusual fire hazards, if there are any. Uh, first aid measures for eye, skin contact, inhalation, ingestion, and notes the position. Uh, there's firefighting measures. I don't think in home use, we have to worry too much about a fire, but the information is there nonetheless. Uh, accidental release, that is to say spills, how to handle and store. Exposure control, uh, particularly if you use a lot of this stuff. I mean, most of us would, would be spraying every 10 days, two weeks probably. But uh, if, if you, for instance, we're running a garden service and we're, we're spraying gardens every day, you need to be a little more careful about exposure control. Uh, physical and chemical properties, stability, reactivity. Here's your toxic, here's your LD50s for ingestion, dermal, that is on the skin, inhalation, eye contact, skin contact, skin sensitization. You know, so that all of these are not especially alarming. Uh, no reproductive or developmental effects, uh, no chronic uh, effects noted. Uh, 
they don't consider it to be a carcinogen. Uh, the tetrahydrofurfural alcohol, it all says inhaling the vapors at high concentration, but you're probably not going to do that. Uh, what the target organs would be, uh, ecological information, that's sort of interesting because you see that it, that, I wish my, wish my mouse were working better. Uh, there it is. Green algae, it, similar to fungi, so 1.6 part per million will, will, will inhibit that. Uh, birds, not terribly toxic to ducks, but it is rather toxic to fish. So as, as I said, if you live near a pond, you certainly don't want to get the stuff in the pot if there are fish in it. How to dispose, regulatory information, and that's about it. So, so uh, as I used to say in the Johnny Carson show, everything you want to know about this is in these six pages. So not coming to the real safety measures, how do we protect ourselves? Our major concerns are contact with the skin. Please notice the hashtag. Uh, especially contact of skin contact with the concentrated material. Notice the hashtag. Eye contact, we, we certainly want to avoid that in general. And so ditto. Concentrates are worse than the dilute material. We've been through that. We don't want to inhale the spray mist, if, if at all avoidable. Well, we don't want to inhale it anyway. And we want to use appropriate personal protective equipment hereafter called PPE. Now, it's July. It's 90 degrees outside. It's as humid as all get out. The sun's beating down, and I need to spray my roses because I'm afraid I'm afraid I'm going to get black spot. So yeah, I love to dress for the occasion. So I like to just throw on a tank top, a pair of shorts, and some sandals and go out and do it. Is that personal protective equipment? Nope. No matter how hot it is, that that won't do. But on the other hand. You don't need to dress like this either. And this is Steve's picture. And I believe under all that, that's Kitty Belinda's. <laughs> so to protect your skin, wear a long sleeve shirt or long pants. Wear a cap is not a bad idea. Wear a sweatband. Well, if it's a hot day, you don't want sweat getting in your eyes. And you don't want to be tempted to rub your eyes when there's the possibility that something might be on your the gloves that you're wearing on your hands that I, can, that I now mentioned that you want to wear some sort of gloves. I prefer to use the uh, the blue nitrile exam gloves that you can, you can buy at any drugstore. And we've seen a lot of, especially during these COVID years. Uh, they're thin, so you have good dexterity. They will, in general, protect your skin for just about anything you're likely to use in the garden. They're disposable. You certainly don't want to reuse them, just toss them after use. The one disadvantage I see is that on a hot day and you sweat underneath them, at least for me, they, they tend to split. So you need to replace them. And when your hands are sweaty, it's hard to get a new pair on. But we can live with that. Um, if you use heavier gloves, the problem is, is that you lose some dexterity and especially when you're handling the concentrates, you don't want to do that. Uh, so I think that's a good idea. The vinyl gloves, I haven't really tried. They, they, they may be okay. Uh, latex gloves, you don't see so much anymore. Some people are allergic to latex. Latex tends to be more porous than these other, other choices, and you uh, want to avoid that as well. Footwear is interesting. You certainly want to wear socks so you have your ankles covered. So you basically, you want to cover all your skin where you, wherever you can. Uh, what are you going to wear for shoes? That's an interesting question. Uh, I suppose something waterproof would be ideal. Uh, maybe the ideal form of that would be something like 
like your LL Bean mud shoes. Uh, I don't have a pair of those. Uh, what else might you use? Well, keep in mind that leather is porous. So a little bit of mist on a leather shoe, not a big issue, but a, a big spill on a leather shoe, the material's gonna soak into that leather, leather and you'll never get it out. So those shoes would then be history. Uh, sports shoes are probably even worse because they, they tend to be canvas or some sort of some sort of plastic material that's very porous and and would go right through to your skin so uh, i guess uh, i guess failing anything else uh, an old pair potentially disposable pair of uh leather shoes if you don't have the yellow beans is uh, the best way to go protecting your eyes uh i would say don't go out if you have contact lenses don't go out and spray with just your contacts in without anything else. If you get some kind of chemical material between a contact lens and your cornea, it can do some damage before you have a chance to get the lens out and, and to rinse your eye out compared to just a, a bare eye. So for those of us who wear glasses, obviously we want to keep wearing the glasses. Uh, having glasses with side shields or side shields that you can attach to your regular glasses that would be a, an even better situation that would keep material coming in from the, from, uh, the sides. Uh, goggles are a possibility, uh, especially if you have contacts and don't have glasses, uh, maybe a pair of ski goggles or, or swim goggles over the over your eyes with the contacts in would, would be a good idea. Uh, be extra careful with triferene and chlorothalonil. You really don't want to get that stuff anywhere near your eyes. So I don't don't think about using either one of them without without eye protection. And if you get some some of that on your the gloves that you're wearing, especially the concentrate, get those gloves off and change them right away before you're even slightly tempted to get those hands near your face. Uh, Daconil that you normally buy for consumer use is, is in a suspension, looks like white paint. Uh, that would be the preferred way to handle it. You can get a bulk powder, but I would consider that to be much more of an eye hazard than the, than the liquid suspension. The fact that, that chlorothalonil is almost entirely insoluble in anything, which is one reason why its oral toxicity is so low, uh, means that for it, it to be effective at blocking fungi on the uh, foliage of your roses or other plants, it has to be milled down to an extremely fine powder. And it's not hard then to get a powder that fine to become airborne. If it becomes airborne, it could find its way into your eyes. So I'd say uh, go, with a, go with a liquid suspension if you're going to use that. And uh, if you do use powders, be very careful and be sure you have that, that's where I would be wearing goggles and, and perhaps even a face shield. Uh, protect for inhalation. Uh, we don't want the airborne spray mist to be near our faces. Uh, you know, even though the diluted spray mist is has very dilute, very little material in it, we still don't want to be inhaling it. Uh, the advice is always not to spray on a windy day. I live on a hilltop. And unless I go out at dawn, there's almost always at least a breeze. I won't spray if it's really windy. If there is a breeze, somehow I have to cope with it. Uh, if there's a light breeze, you want to make sure that you're upwind from the from the spray. Uh, but now, if you have tall plants, climbers, or you live in a mild climate where all your roses get to be really tall, and you have to lift that spray wand. Uh, up the shoulder or over your head, that's where you need to be extra careful. Um, my old friend, uh, now deceased Clarence Rhodes, had a spray wand that was about six feet long that I think he used for climbers and, and to stay away from the tall plants. That's one possibility, but I think that, I think that was something he uh, invented and used himself. I don't know how available those are. Uh, certainly it applies to your eye safety that that yeah, spraying high, they're more likely to be inhaled, more likely to get in, into your eyes. 
So now this brings me to my sermon on masks and respirators. So bear with me, but uh, masks have very much been in the news of late. The thing on the left, I call a mask. The thing on the right, I call a respirator. Now, some masks like the N95s and the KN95s are, are also called respirators. To me, they're still a mask. A mask is something made out of fiber, generally for a single use, uh, mostly intended to deal with particulates. Uh, a mask can be used either to keep things from being inhaled into you. They can also be used to be prevent things from being exhaled by you. In the case of COVID-19, the latter was the more important that the whole idea of wearing a mask is if you had an infection but weren't acutely ill at the moment, you could be infecting other people and the purpose of the mask was to catch any, any droplets or particles coming out, being exhaled by you from infecting other people. Uh, secondarily, the mask is in, uh, might prevent some inhalation of infectious material, but but the, by the time the, the droplets evaporate, they might be able to get through through a mask, but they do offer some protection that way. Uh, in the garden, we're more concerned about not inhaling particles or droplets or vapors, and we'll get the vapors. But I'll tell you this, that neither a mask or a respirator is effective unless it forms a tight seal around both your mouth and your nose because air like water or any fluid or any gas or electricity for that matter, always takes the path, path of least resistance. So if there is a gap around that mask or if it's not covering your nose, just your mouth, guess what? You might as well not be wearing it. It's not doing you or anyone else any good. So that's a mask. A respirator is a little more sophisticated device. You can see a respirator has a permanent mask and then it has two filter canisters which deal with inhalation. Now this, the exhalation from this respirator, I think most of them is through a one-way valve that you see here. That means that they don't, they, they aren't for preventing you from infecting somewhere else, but they're, they're intended entirely for, for protecting you from in, inhaled hazards. Now, respirator is maybe a little scarier looking than a mask than others, but in some situations, it's the safest. You notice that there are these two cartridges, filter cartridges on the respirator. Those are replaceable so that if it, over time when used, you can replace it with the same. This looks like a paper cartridge that would be for particles, but there are also other cart part <laughs> cartridges that can be used for filtering out uh, things like solvent vapors. Not so much an issue these days. I think most of the garden chemical formulations are water-based these days. But that's, that's the advantage of a respirator is that they are changeable. And in any case, whether you're using a mask or a respirator, you want to make sure that you have the right device for the right intended application. So if you're dealing with particles, well, there's a degree as to how small a particle it can filter out. So for instance, the, the basic the so-called surgical mask will not filter as well as a KN95 or an N95 for small particles, for instance. Neither one of those is any good for, for solvent vapors. For that, you'd have to go to a, probably a, an activated charcoal filter on a respirator. So you have to be sure you're using the right device if you're, if you're worried about inhalation hazards. So I covered all that and you, you'll see that they're industrial type devices and they, they have ratings and I, I will re repeat that you must have a slight fit around the nose and the mouth. The other thing about respirators is that they are sized. I decided I wanted one once. I grabbed one off the shelf at Lowe's or Home Depot. I got it home, noticed that it was a size medium. I put it on and it was too small for my fat head. So be sure you get the right size if you're buying a respirator. 
so the cartridges are re replaceable and yes, do your research before buying one of these. End of sermon. Before and after you spray, be sure you follow the mixing instructions carefully. Do not overdose or underdose. Overdosing simply waste material. And again, the old Paracelsus dilution factor, the right amount of something can be useful, the wrong amount of something can be poison. Some things, if used in excess, can harm your plants. Underdosing might be ineffective, wouldn't cure the situation, and worse yet, could result in development of resistance. And if anyone's interested, I have a whole other lecture that deals with that subject. Uh, do not combine incompatible materials, so be sure you read the label to understand that. If you ever use herbicides, be sure that you buy a separate sprayer for that, because no matter how much you rinse that sprayer that's had herbicides in it, I don't want any chance that I got to get some of that on my roses. Uh, don't mix more than you need, because you have to deal with getting rid of it. Uh, if I use fungicide and find out I have a little bit left at the end, I have a big old lilac bush that gets powdery mildew, so I'll, I'll spray the remainder on the lilac to, to get rid of it in a semi-useful fashion that way. Uh, be sure your sprayers are in good condition. Over time, they typically have O-rings and the fittings, and O-rings will begin to dry out, crack and break, and that'll, that'll start causing leaks, and you don't want to have leaks and dribbling from your sprayers. So be sure they're in good condition. And for many sprayers, you, you can buy repair kits that have new O-rings and so forth. And maybe a good idea to do that at the beginning of every season. Properly dispose of your leftovers and rinse your sprayer. So remove and wash your clothing, dispose of any gloves you've been using. Yeah, so good idea get out of the clothes you're wearing for right in the washing machine and turn it on don't wash it with anything else is, is a good idea and it's also not a bad idea in general just to hop in the shower after you're done now besides keeping our person safe we want to keep our chemicals safe as well uh, and going both ways obviously you want to keep chemicals away from children because adults won't play with them presumably but children may. And the other thing is if you sprayed your roses, you wanna keep children and pets inside and away from the sprayed area until the spray dries. Once the spray is dry, there, there's really essentially no hazard of them being around them, assuming you're not gonna go eating the leaves or anything silly like that. Uh, lock them up, the chemicals that is, not the kids. Uh, and consider the four enemies of chemical stability because you want your chemicals to be stable while they're in the, in the bottle or in the bag and while you're and keeping them for your future use. Ironically, once you put them on the plants, you want them to be unstable so that they don't persist in the environment for an extended period of time. But the four enemies of chemical stability are heat, light, especially the blue to ultraviolet end of the spectrum, oxygen, and time, notice the hashtag. So the best advice is to store your chemicals in a cool dark place and be sure that, the cap, that they're tightly capped if they're liquids and, and that uh, bags are sealed. The, the liquid forms are more likely to decompose than, than uh, dry material powders, but uh, you certainly don't want powders to get wet. That would, that would be the, the biggest issue with those. Oh. It used to be that uh, chemicals were most, the liquid chemicals were mostly in brown bottles and the, that would filter out the most troublesome end of the light. Now they tend to be in opaque plastic containers, not a problem. If you keep them tightly capped, the, the amount of oxygen they're exposed to uh, is minimized by whatever the volume of the container is. Uh, time, that's the one unavoidable thing. Uh, you can check and see if there is an expiration date on the container and you can also assume that that's something you've had for a very long time may have lost its potency and needs to be replaced. 
uh, you want to avoid cold or freezing conditions too, because that not so much destroying the chemicals, but that can break down a formulation. You might have something where all of a sudden a lot of the materials settle down to a lump on the bottom of the container. Had that happen to me once. Uh, some things are, are suspensions that can break down and look like a hollandaise sauce that's grown bad, and that's that's no good either. So uh, all things in moderation, cool but not cold, and, and cool but not hot. Here's a picture of Steve's storage shed. You see there's a lock on it that would keep the kitties out. Uh, looks like it's in a shady place, which is good, but an outdoor shed that's in the sun in the summer is going to get really hot. So that's not always the uh, best solution for storing your chemicals. Uh, a cool basement, if you have one, would be better. But but uh, yeah, watch out for the heat. If it's if it's out baking in the sun, that's not good. Don't repackage chemicals for sharing. Hashtag that is both illegal and unsafe. It, to transfer to unlabeled or improperly labeled containers. It's very tempting if you've gone beyond the basics and you've bought one of those expensive chemicals from Rosemania or someplace like that and say, I'm never going to use this and the rest of my wife and some of my friends will like one. I think I'll put some in a mason, mason jar and, uh, and sell it to them or give it to them. Bad idea. It, like I say, it's illegal and it's unsafe. Okay, so there, there's a jar in there. Thanks, Steve, for the picture. This says Rally. What the heck is Rally? It doesn't say. What's in Rally? It doesn't say. How do you mix Rally? It doesn't say. What's it used for? It doesn't say. How toxic is it? It doesn't say. You get the picture. That's why it's illegal and unsafe to, to do that. Disposal. Disposal of diluted spray material. Well, again, we said try not to mix more than needed or find an, an alternative place to, to spray to use it up. Don't store excess because one in high dilution, that might speed up the breakdown of the chemical in, in a lot of water. Don't pour it in a storm drain, pour it in a sink, flush it down the loo or anything like that. That's not nice to do or safe. I end up usually, pour, if there's a little bit left, I'll, I'll pour it on the ground next to the house. That's the best solution I can come up with. I'm a long way from any body of water that I might get into. I think there's absolutely zero chance of any of that happening. So that's probably the best thing for me to do. But uh, can, you have to consider your own situation. If you have disposing of concentrates, if you have an empty container, uh, best thing to do is rinse it and add the rinse to your sprayer tank when you're making up a spray. Then recycle the container, don't reuse it for any purpose. Any unused material you want to get rid of, uh, check and see if your municipality has a hazard materials drop-off program. That's the best way to deal with that. You don't want to put it in the trash or anything else. That's even worse than pouring uh, diluted material now down a sink or so forth. Here's a slide from Bruce. Never use or recommend a restricted chemical. Uh, the American Rose Society is not responsible for any recommendation made by a consulting rosarian that is contrary to this manual. Which is to say that if you give somebody some improper advice that would put you in hot water, uh, don't expect the American Road Society to help you. They are going to throw you under the bus, basically. So be aware of that. Uh, here's my slide. It's the first page of the EPA list of restricted use products and the first page of the Massachusetts list of restricted products. Uh, all of these things, they may be outlawed altogether in your area or they may require that you be a licensed applicator to use them. You know, you can always go to your extension service or whatever, take the class, take the test and become a licensed applicator, but that really shouldn't be necessary for dealing with a rose garden. What to do about an accident? 
with a little spray mist or dribble gets on your glove or or a little bit blows back on your clothes, don't panic. If anything really gets wet, remove any any wet article and wash your skin. When dealing with the concentrate, you have to be more careful. Anything becomes contaminated, get it off right away and and wash or preferably shower to be sure your skin is clean. If you get a lot on your skin or develop any kind of a rash or itch or any other systems, you would need to seek medical advice. If you have a spill, well, if it's anything more than a few drops, it could be wiped up with a, a paper towel and, and disposed of. You can use something like kitty litter or sawdust or oil absorbent to soak up any, any particular significant volume of, of uh, liquid that's been spilled. Any powders or I suppose any of this absorbed material, you want to sweep it up, bag it and dispose of it. And when you're doing that, that's you, you do want to make sure that your glove doesn't have other, other uh, protection, protective material on, uh, mask, respirators, eye protection and so forth. Okay, so you're consulting Rosary and somebody asks you about a potential problem. What do you how what do you do when you advise them? Number one, you ascertain if they really do have a problem, an insect or disease problem. Then find out if they would use pesticides, because they may or they may not. If they if they will, you want to suggest the least toxic product to, to deal with the problem for the um, initial uh, solution. And you want to be sure to tell them that insecticides, miticides can kill beneficials as well as pests, hashtag. Bees are insects, ladybugs are insects. If you're out spraying insecticide when they are active, you're going to kill them as well as whatever it is that you're going to control. So be aware of that. If you feel you have to use an insecticide, don't do it when the bees are active. If you see ladybugs and their larvae dining on aphids, you don't want to do anything about that. Let them take care of the aphids. Uh, you also need to tell your people, hashtag, that fungicides work best when applied preventatively or prophylactically, if you will, and regularly. Uh, once you get a fungal disease well established, they're very hard to get rid of. Recommend readily available consumer products that you can find at a big box store or failing that at a garden center or an ag way. I guess I should say that if they don't want to use pesticides, you should be aware of what other control methods that you could recommend to deal with the situation, which may be in terms of, of, of a, if, if there's a high disease area for black spot, maybe you need to tell them that they should be using growing pain limbs or, or um, little rattler roses, if, if that's the case, or that's the only way they can control it. So to sum up, here are the rules. Rule number one, read the label. Rule number two, know your material and how to find information. Rule three, read the label. Rule four, use appropriate personal protective equipment. Rule five, read the label. Rule six, store and dispose of the materials properly. Rule seven, read the label. Rule eight, don't panic. Rule nine, we'll do, do what the label says. Rule 10, and this is an important one, Respect chemicals, don't fear them. And I'm gonna paraphrase Yoda here. Fear leads to nervousness. Nervousness leads to mistakes. Mistakes have consequences. So yeah, it, it's a bottle of fungicide. It's not a, not a live rattlesnake. So you don't have to approach the bottle of, fung of fungicide like you would approach a live rattlesnake. The fungicide won't jump out of the bottle and bite you. But in terms of consequences, consider this. A green little chemist on a green little day 
Take some green little chemicals and a green little way. The green little grass is now tenderly wave or the green little chemist, green little grave. So as King George said in World War II, keep calm and carry on. And thank you, sorry I was talking a little fast at the beginning, I wanted to make sure I didn't dwell too long on the less important stuff. So now I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Craig, and we'll begin our 15 minute Q&A. Uh, we may not get to all the questions, but somebody will respond to your question if we don't get to it. So the first question comes from Andre Wolf. Are there any insecticides that are not hazardous to pets and which are effective on roses? Well, any of them could potentially be hazardous to pets. You know, the fact is, that, uh, as I said, that was the unfortunate thing about the neonics because their their toxicity to mammals. Well, you say it was similar to some of the phosphates, but you use so much less of it that the chances of it being toxic to, to mammals was unfortunate. Uh, the be the best thing, as I said, is is if you have a dog or a cat, outdoor cat, keep them indoors and while while you're spraying it until the sprays dry. And I don't think there's any real hazard then of uh, of them being around. Uh, you know, if you have a silly dog that eats 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 leaves, I hope I hope not. You know, you don't want them to do that, but you don't want them to do that anyway. So. I don't know if that really answers the question specifically, but but uh, yeah, the, I think the phosphates were worse actor, actors than than the, than the insecticides you can buy now. So in general. All right. Well, I have two questions that are related, so I'm going to combine the two questions. Uh, one's by Catherine Terzi, and the other one is from Kathy Porter, a candidate. Um, Uh, as to mission and ethics, Catherine is an organic gardener for ornamentals, and her community endorses that, or encourages that. That means not using those products at all. What is the ARS position on reducing abuse of these products? Also, uh, Catherine, Kathy would like to know, as a CR, must we recommend these toxic products? Well, um, my personal position is that as long as something is legal, it's it's not the position of the American Rose Society that we, we should say you either should or should not use it. If something is not legal, if it's an unregistered product, for instance, uh, we should not be recommending it. I, I realize that opinions are, are highly variable on this and the but I think as a consulting rosarian, we have to be, and again, this is this is my opinion, we have to respect both sides of the issue. So if I'm talking to someone who wants to grow fiber teas for show and is in a human climate and you know black spot's gonna be a problem, we could talk about responsible use for fungicides keeping in mind that they are in general a lot less toxic than insecticides. Uh, on the other hand, if I have a person that says, I I don't want to use any of this, and even if I do, I'm not going to say you're crazy not to, not to be using this. I say, okay, here's what you can do. Uh, give good airspace around your plants. Consider what, what varieties you want to plant. In other words, I, I think we have to be sensitive to to the uh, police of the people we're advising uh, and possibly have to suspend some of, you know, be flexible on our own part. All right. And this is Diane. I would add to that that that's part of our role as consulting Rosarians is to understand both chemical and non chemical, you know, um, programs, right? You, if you're not going to use fungicides, you know, what are the most, you know, disease resistant roses um, 
that you could grow and that won't be much of a problem, for example. Uh, we are looking to do more programs um, uh, that are on IPM and other opportunities to reduce or you know, to address insects or disease in your garden without using chemicals. Um, so we'll, we will continue to support you know, the variety of needs and concerns um, that is absolutely important. And this consulting rosarians play a critical role in that. All right, thank you, Diane. Uh, candidate Alan Rolfling has, is there a typical shelf life for these chemicals? Depends on how they're stored and depends on what the chemical is. So, uh, so you, you know, I think a couple, if they're stored properly, I'd say if, uh, a, a few seasons is probably fine, but you know, also look at the container and see if there's an expiration date on it. Again, I think, you know, dry, dry materials, powders, that would be something like manzate or, or probably quite stable for a long time. Uh, but I, I think the manufacturers have to consider this one when they when they devise a formulation or devise a, a compound to begin with. All right. Uh, candidate Jan DiCrescenzo, are there insecticide soaps toxic to beneficials? Uh, possibly. Uh, uh, I would say the soaps are probably most toxic to soft body insects like aphids and the and the like than 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 something like a like a beetle. But uh, yeah, I I think of them more as as used on on indoor plants where you have things like white flies and aphids and so forth than than using it out on out on uh, an outdoor bush, but. Remember, insecticides kill insects. Helena Williams would like to ask, what is your opinion on home remedies for fungicides such as black spot? Well, well, I've heard there's a lot of things I've heard of, like people spraying milk, uh, home homemade equivalents of the Cornell mixture, which is which is potassium bicarbonate. People use sodium bicarbonate baking soda instead. Uh, potassium would be preferred to sodium, but it's not that big a deal. Uh, along with some oil and, and maybe a little bit of a spreader compound. I, I think those are most useful for powdery mildew. Whether they're really effective against black spot, I don't know. The, the other thing is, is that if they get rained on, it'll, it'll get washed right off. So it's, it's something that would have to be applied more, more frequently. I, I would say they're, that they're uh, possibly of some use, but uh, uh, and leave it to leave it to that. All right. uh, candidate uh, KG Mildy, is there a chemical that addresses crown gall? Uh, no, crown gall is bacterial, and you know I I have not heard of being able to to treat crown gall uh, by putting something in the soil. You, you might try excising the gall and then then putting something on the cut area like some very dilute chlorine bleach that try and kill any remaining bacteria. Whether that would be successful or not, I don't know, because then you have an open wound, the bacteria are probably in the soil. So that that's uh, that's more of a problem. I, I think eventually you have to replace the plant and you either have to let the soils stay idle for a time or or dig it out and replace it with fresh soil to get to get rid of the bacteria. But that that's that's harder to treat. All right. Connie Hurd in there would like to know what organic compounds do you suggest for insecticides and fungus? You mentioned neem. Is that organic at least toxic? Neem is organic. It comes from a tree. Um, and, and we said the toxicity is low. Uh, 
I, I would not advise this nicotine. Uh, I think there was another question about homemade. I, I remember there was a guy who used to be on PBS fundraisers that had all kinds of concoctions. And I think he was steeping cigar butts or cigarette butts. And of course, well, what that does is leach out nicotine. Uh, <laughs> that might be organic, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, so, so Nima is a possibility. Uh, I would say, if, in terms of, of disease, the, the best way to, to grow organically and avoid disease is, is to be growing disease-resistant rose varieties. And there, we're seeing more of them now. You know, most the, these sprays that are le legal in the United States at this point in time are generally not allowed in Europe. So the European breeders are really working on developing resistant rose strains. And, you know, frankly, I I will spray my roses. I can't say that I enjoy it as I'm getting older. You know, it's, a, it's work, it's, it's drudgery. If I have resistant roses and I have some, uh, I, I was laid up with a hamstring injury, so I didn't get out so much the last season. I could see which roses were resistant and which weren't. And uh, <laughs> right, right now, the resistant ones look a lot more attractive to me. <laughs> All right, Paula Olson would like to know, can you grow roses organically without chemical sprays? Sure, if you, uh, if you uh, are willing to accept maybe some insect damage or do some things like hand picking beetles off your plants or squishing aphids, <laughs> although I'm sure we'll have a lot to say about that next week. Uh, you, you know, Will Rattler's roses are disease resistant, Ping Lim's roses are disease resistant, and they're, they're wonderful plants. I mean, they, they don't look like show rose hybrid teas, but they're, they're beautiful roses and they don't need the attention. So I, I would say the best way to do it is to choose your varieties carefully. All right. This is Diane. I would agree with that completely, Craig. And in fact, we know that more and more breeders are focused on growing roses with these tendencies. I was speaking with Christian Bedard a couple of weeks ago, and he mentioned that 10 years ago they started to build this type of, you know, resistance into their plants. And um they, they are really starting to see the benefit of that. And as we know, Will Radler um, was one of the great stewards early on to start that as well. And uh, we see that in roses coming out of Europe. And uh, there's actually some good discussion about that when I was at the World Convention, World Rose Convention in Adelaide this past October. All right, moving on. Uh, candidate Studer, Steward, Jay would like to know what chemicals, organic or not, do you recommend for tri thrips? For thrips? Yes. Okay. I, well, where I live, thrips are not much of a problem. I, I rarely, if ever, see them. Uh, one thing that's labeled for thrips is Avid, which is a, which is avermectin, it's a miticide, it's also expensive, but I happen to have some of that. So that's that's what I've used. Uh, they're a little tricky otherwise, and and I would suggest, you know, if there's if there's someone who lives further south where they're where they're more of an issue, they, they may have a they may have an idea. But the number of insecticides in general has come down to about the only thing that you can buy these days are pyrethroids related to pyrethrin. Now pyrethrin originally was a natural product. So you could say it was organic. It comes out of a chrysanthemum that native to Africa. Uh, pyrethrin itself is relatively mild as an insecticide and, and in many cases, the insects could metabolize it to something harmless before before it actually killed them. So uh, the original raid going back to, oh, gee, the 1960s, I guess, uh, had something else in it called piperonyl butoxide that inhibited the breakdown of the pyrethrin by the, the insects. 
So the chemists got to work and they, they made synthetic analogs to this natural product. And that's, I mentioned cyfluthrin, that, that's one of them that you see. And those are about the only types available. So how effective they are on thrips, I don't have personal experience to really tell you. All right, we have time for one more question. And again, if your question isn't answered, someone will respond to it and send you an email. Ann Ball, a candidate, can you speak briefly to products designed to deter critters, critters, especially deers and rabbits? Yeah, they're rabbits. I had some issues with those. I live in the city, so the deer don't come into the city, fortunately. The most exotic thing I've seen is a groundhog and turkey. Uh, rabbits, though, they are around. And I, I have used mothballs, uh, but you don't want to use mothballs. There's a chance that children or pets could pick them up. But uh, mothballs keep rabbits and other small rodents away from your plants, especially if you're covering them in, uh, in the winter. Some people have responded on there. They say spinosa works for thrips. That, that's that you could buy as Captain Jack's dead bug. So uh, you might try that if you have a thrip issue. That also works on uh, on on uh, grubs and and uh, larvae. All right, hey, this well, is Bruce. This is Bruce. I, I, I use a uh, for deer. I use a product called Deer Scram which is mostly garlic. It makes an interesting aroma to your rose garden, uh, but uh, supposedly deer don't like garlic and they'll, they will be able to sniff it for quite some time and they'll stay away. And it has the additional effect that it keeps the vampires out of your rose bed too. I haven't seen any in mine, so <laughs> it must work. <laughs> well, again, that was the end of our time for Q and A today. And I'll turn it back over to either John or Diane. Hi, Gary. That'll actually be me, Kim. <laughs> and this is our Diane or John. Did you have anything you'd like to say before I close it out? I just uh, this is say Diane. I, I don't. I just want to again welcome everyone. Um, I hope that this was uh, very helpful for you and beneficial. And uh, we will be having another session next week. So please join us. Okay, great. And uh, thanks everyone. Again, this is Kim Merritt, the assistant to the ARS executive director, Mr. John, Cor John Corkin. We wanna thank you all for attending today's webinar. And thank you, Diane, Dave, and Craig for such wonderful presentations. Earlier, there was a question regarding the uh, district CR chair for Deep South. Uh, just to let you know, that person is Janet Newberg. Um, if any of you are unsure who your district chair is, you can visit our website, rose.org, go to resources, then board materials, scroll down the page, and you will see links to click on for district appointments. There you can find contact information for not only your district CR chair, but other chairs, chairs as well. So, uh, and that list will be updated with Janet's information. Okay, uh, this webinar will be available on the ARS website and YouTube channel next week. If your question was not answered during the webinar, you will receive a response via email. This coming Monday, you will receive an email to register for next Saturday's webinar. And again, thank you all for attending and enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye.